Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, your insert today. On the front side is your take home. Please make sure you do so today. This keeps you engaged in God's word all week long. And on the back side, you will see the Ten Commandments as printed in the Spark Bible that we've given our second graders who um, have kind of been leading us in this this week. Um, what I want you to do is read this with me out loud. Okay, so grab this. And I, for one, am grateful to have the Ten Commandments in language I can understand. So, um, we get to read it together this way. So please join me. I am God, the only God. Honor me above all other things and people. There are no other gods for you, only me. My name is special. Don't use it with bad words or mean talk. Take a day of rest each week. Call it the Sabbath. And make it a special day for God. Show your mom, dad, and others who take care of you your love and respect. Don't hurt others with your words or actions. If you get married, you must be loyal to your husband or wife. Don't take things that aren't yours. Tell only the truth about your family, friends, and even those you do not know. Be happy with what you have. Don't wish for things that other people have. The lesson for this day. So I want to show you a picture. Um, so if you would, put that up on the screen for me. Rob, there we go. Very good. You might recognize this. Over 60 years ago, on a February day in 1953, two guys, um, James Watson, Francis Crick, very good friends, researchers, scientists, walked into their local pub in Cambridge, England to make a stunning lunchtime announcement. They declared that they had discovered, quote, the secret of life, unquote, the chemical structure of DNA. It was world-changing, a brilliant, insightful labor of research. And today, I think all of us, even non-scientists like me, are aware of this beautiful, sinuous, swirling, double helix model of DNA. It's a complex structure. Watson and Crick managed to unsnarl the swirl. They broke down its chemical composition of the building block for life. And now, in the 61st anniversary year of that discovery, scientists have managed to follow that double helix and to create a rough draft of the human genome, the map of our genetic structure, a blueprint of humanity. Or is it? Science, as it is wont to do, leads from one discovery to another, and sometimes its claims are superseded uh, by new claims and new insights and new truths. And in truth, it seems now that the more we know about the structure of DNA, the more we know that it's only the beginning. It's just the base. It's just the foundation. A scientist named Natalie Angier put it this way in a New York Times article, DNA on its own does nothing. It can't make eyes blue, livers bilious, or brains function. In humanity's search for the secret of life, there were many things we thought, but at one point we thought we'd find the answers in physical structure and chemical compound of the DNA. Then we thought if we just knew the DNA formula for each gene, we'd have it linked. But now we're just beginning to understand that it's really all about proteins, not only the DNA. Again, according to Angier, DNA, quote, holds bare bones information, suggestions, really, for the construction of the proteins from which all life is built. But that's it. DNA can't read those instructions. It can't divide. It can't keep itself clean. It can't sit up properly. Proteins that surround it do all of those tasks. Stripped of the context within the body's cells, these haggling florid ecosystems of tens of thousands of proteaceous fauna. You know I did not write that sentence, right? Um, <laughs> DNA is helpless, speechless. It is DOA. Interesting, isn't it? Perhaps this insight into the true nature of DNA, important, foundational, basic, without it you can't go anywhere, but yet still in need of proteins, and there's probably more to learn to be able to make life. Perhaps that's a metaphor that we can use to introduce these 10 words as known in Jewish literature. The Decalogue, not a monologue, not a dialogue, a Decalogue, 10 words. We've come to know them as 10 commandments. Maybe it's a metaphor, this DNA metaphor, that can help us understand what they really are and what they are not, okay? There's a really provocative guy named Erwin McManus 
um, who leads um, a, a pretty edgy, pretty amazing missional effort called Mosaic in Los Angeles. If you want an interesting trip into a new way of being the church, check Mosaic out. And he has just published a book on creativity that is really setting some of the Christian world on fire. He did some work on the Ten Commandments and he, he really shook up kind of our normal understanding about uh, the Decalogue. Instead of looking at this list of do's and don'ts as the highest possible rung of human moral behavior, McManus suggested instead the Ten Commandments are the lowest possible standard of humane living. They are the basics. They are the foundations. By the way, that's the sweetest sound in worship, okay? Can I just say, if you ever, you know, I'm getting to be, you know, I'm approaching a certain age. <laughs> Okay, not going down that road. Okay, so anyway, um, it's good to remember um, that we're really here to worship God, right? That doesn't mean we have to hear every word or that God's doing something more powerful here. And God loved the congregation that had babies. Sorry, I'll roll retreat from that uh, now. Um, where was I? My goodness. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, there we go, Ir Irwin McManus. The Ten Commandments are the lowest possible standard of humane living, and stated like that, you have to kind of agree, right? It's not that the behavior is ordered by God to the Israelites wasn't a gift, wasn't divinely inspired, wasn't wonderful and amazing, and the beginning of life-giving interaction with God to define relationship between us and God, us and each other, us and the world. But it's just that the Ten Commandments aren't really representative of God's highest desire for us, is it? Is it only that God wants us to just not kill each other? No. God in Jesus in flesh so showed us an abundant life. God, Jesus said, I didn't come to just give you life. I came to give you abundant life. Jesus embodied in flesh the real desires of God for humanity. And the New Testament authors and thinkers and believers and followers of Jesus processed it to say we are to grow into the full likeness of Jesus Christ. McManus notes it this way, he said, they are not the standards by which the angels live. This isn't God's attempt to pull us up beyond the human into the spiritual. The Ten Commandments are the lowest possible standard of humane living. Stop and consider what they demand of us, McManus says. Maybe it'd help if we rephrased it in everyday language. Here it goes. Hey, could you stop killing each other? Oh yeah, by the way, could you just not steal each other's stuff? And it would be really helpful if you wouldn't lie to each other either. And here's the thought, could you not take other people's people? their husbands, their wives, or their stuff. It sounds basically like the instructions that I would give on a junior high overnight, okay? <laughs> We're all gonna survive this, okay? <laughs> Don't kill each other, okay? If we all come out of this alive, we've had a successful retreat, right? There's more that God ins uh, aspires us to. And it takes us through the commandments, not around them. I'm not saying ignore them, but I'm saying go deeper into them. Unlock them, build on them to something bigger, something more representative of Jesus. Something that you are entirely capable of. You know, I, I believe that God creates us with hearts that are able to really, really grow. And it doesn't stop when you're 20 or 30 or 40. I look at some of our saints who are 80 and 90, and I see that it is possible. If we want to believe it, if we want to pursue it, it is possible that our hearts can be bigger, our compassion can be larger until the very last day of our life. I always think it's just so sad when I see people quit growing. God has wired us in such a way that we can the old-fashioned term, the old theological term would be sanctification. That we can grow more into the likeness of Jesus every day of our whole life. Here, God gives Israel these precious ten words, these ten commandments, but they are not the be-all and end-all for human achievement. Yet we kind of sanctify them. We put them on our walls and even in our judicial uh, chambers now. Wouldn't it be sad if all of us who are parents only taught our children these things. Isn't it wonderful when we teach them these things and say there's more? 
Let's go deeper. And I'm going to take one example, and that's the Sabbath, okay? Something you and I might not think about too much, but let's look at it just a little bit. There's a psychoanalyst, a disciple of Sigmund Freud, um, named Sandor Frenzy. And he identified a disorder he called Sunday neurosis. Today, you and I would call it workaholism. I've had trouble saying that word all morning. You know what I mean, right? It's that seven days a week, 24 hours a day pace that most of us are on. It's the tether that we have to our smartphones. It's the way in which our ears are tuned to the ding of an email at 10.30 at night on a Friday, okay? We know this, right? For my life, for your life, we have nothing that really truly resembles a Sabbath. So let's go a little bit deeper here. When we fail to find the rhythm of life that embraces both work and play, both labor and leisure, both breathing out and breathing in, both plow and pillow, as an old preacher once said, lives go out of whack and we just get sick. Sabbath is more than just not working. It's not just laying on a couch, although laying on a couch is okay. It is a preacher's Sabbath, let me just say. But according to Judith Shelovitz, in her recent New York Times Magazine article, she argues to, quote, bring back the Sabbath, unquote. You see, the Jewish invention of the Sabbath invented the idea of social equality. It wasn't rest just for the man. It was a rest for the whole household. It was a rest even for the slave. It was a rest even for the beast of burden. It was an undreamed of notion yet that every single creature has the right to rest, not just the rich and privileged. Covered under the fourth commandment are women, slaves, strangers, and improbably animals. Because we have been created by God and created in the image of God, think about this. What was the pinnacle of the creation story in 1 Genesis? Not the first day or the second day or the third day or the fifth day or the sixth day, but the seventh day God rested. So too with you and I. There is something needful about resting. There is something deeply spiritual about resting. There is something that helps us remember ourselves to God and remember ourselves to one another, and even remember ourselves to our own spirit. That's the deeper understanding of the keeping of the Sabbath. It is not just a thou shall not. It's a thou shall find life by resting the way God intended. The act of stopping. Again, from Judith. Her article ends with these words, we have to remember to stop because we have to stop to remember. I use this as an example of taking the basic building block of a commandment and beginning to think deeply and experience more richly what it can mean for us. Just like DNA need protein, you and I need the work of the spirit and the encouragement of each other that we can take from this sacred basic building block and build a rich and full life that is worthy of the children of God, so that we might be a blessing to this world and we might honor God in everything we do. Please don't take anything I have said today to diminish the nature and the importance of the Ten Commandments. Instead, be inspired to aspire to the fullness of Christ. If you would, please, let us pray together. Um, gracious God, we give you thanks. You are amazing, and you know just how to teach us. You give us the basics, you give us the easy, and then you give us a lifetime to explore it. We might find the richness and surprises that await as we become more and more like Jesus on this way, on this lifetime. In Jesus' name, inspire us with the Spirit. In Jesus' name, with grateful hearts, we say, amen.